I'm spraying shaving cream. Say with my friends. On yourself or? With it, yeah, on myself and my friends. Okay, is this a Halloween tradition here in Brooklyn? Yeah. Yes, definitely. But what about this woman with shaving cream on her car? They're having a good time. Could have been worse. Could have been eggs. Eggs? What are you going to do with eggs? They're going to throw them at people. We're going to cook them. I'm going to hit this kid over here. Yeah, we're going to hang out around here. We can <laughs> see. <laughs> Extra large great <laughs> eggs. They put the eggs away because look at this. Down the block, a constable on patrol in the mood to confiscate. Let me have it. Come on, please. Let me have it. Come on. He finally did hand it over. As for the rest, they wrapped up their Halloween on the run. New York police say they will be out in force to make sure no one violates the spirit of Halloween or the law. Will Spence, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Well, Halloween and trick-or-treating can be fun. What's up, everybody? I'm Dave Rubin. This is The Rubin Report. It is November 1st, 2022. And yes, yesterday was Halloween. I hope you had a happy Halloween. We took the boys out in skeleton costumes. And although they cannot eat solid food yet, we got a bag of Kit Kats and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups downstairs for one day when they can. That cold open, I had to just put that in. That was 1984. New York City. Uh, those kids looked about eight years old. I was born in 76, so I was about eight years old at that point, 1984. And it was just such a perfect time capsule of how different things were and how, how much better things were. The idea that these kids were running around in New York City and they're kind of messing around with the cops and yeah, you might get some shaving cream on your car, but at least it's not eggs, as that lady says. And that kid, when the, when the reporter says, uh, what are you gonna do with the eggs? We're going to cook dinner. <laughs> like the accent, it's just so perfect. And it's, it's so emblematic of a simpler time. And what I'm always telling you guys, like, what are we really trying to do politically in the world right now? I think we're just trying to go back to that. I think that if the Gen X people, the eight-year-olds in 84, who are now, you know, somewhere in their 40s, can take the reins of this thing, whether it's a guy like Elon Musk or whether it's a guy like Joe Rogan, or a guy like me, or a guy like you watching this, if you're in that sort of 35 to maybe late 50s thing, that Gen X thing, it's like it's our time to kind of take over. We grew up in a time when things were better and safer and more decent and nobody cared about the race stuff and we weren't interested in chopping children's genitals off. It was the good old days, people, that's the point. Uh, but there is a lot to talk about because one week from today is election day and it's looking real good. But as I always say, let's not count the chickens before they hatch. Uh, you know, you gotta give the devil his due and they can pull out some kind of crazy tricks. We're gonna get into some of their tricks. They're busting out Obama again. I don't think it's gonna work. He seems a little rusty, if you ask me. We got a bunch of clips. Uh, and then really the big story yesterday was that there has been a massive expose that basically what we all thought was happening for quite some time that I've been hinting at, if not outright saying, and many of us, those of us that exist in the online world, uh, that there has been massive coordination with the government uh, and big tech in suppressing your speech when it came to misinformation and COVID related things and all that. A whole bunch of documents have been leaked and text messages and all sorts of stuff. Um, and this could be in, in uh, a real sense, a massive, massive scandal. So we'll see how the media tries to cover it up. Uh, also, my buddy and a man that I know you love if you're watching this show, Larry Elder might be running for president. Like it's real. He's been kind of telling me for months now, almost, almost a year actually, since, uh, since the recall did not work out the way he wanted. He, he kind of had bigger plans ready to roll and Larry's been thinking about it for quite some time. So that's actually where we're gonna start today uh, because Newsweek ran a piece yesterday about a potential Larry Elder for president candidacy. Uh, but Larry put out a video yesterday as well uh, kind of given his vision and what he's been up to, and uh, well, take a look. We are at the Faith and Freedom Coalition here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, I had a really good time. I was sandwiched between two dynamic speakers, but I talked about the issues that affect America. I talked about the breakdown of the family, which in my opinion, our side does not spend enough time talking about. We talk about crime, we talk about poor schools, we talk about people that are not ready to get jobs in our digital economy. 
we're really good with the symptoms. We're not that good with the cause. And we need to talk more and more and more about what's happened to the nuclear intact family. And we got to take the country back. We got to take back the House, take back the Senate. So go to elderforamerica.com, throw a little something in the tip jar because we've got a country to say. The black face of white supremacy, according to the Los Angeles Times. Uh, look, obviously the recall in California did not go well. Larry actually got millions of votes and did way better than most people thought, but for whatever reason, be it the sun or what's going on in wine country or whatever, California just stuck it out with Gavin Newsom. Okay, the machinery, the Democrat machinery there is, it is, it is strong, whether we like it or not. Uh, but Larry has his eyes, I sense, on something much bigger at this point and whether he can become president or not, um, I would argue is actually irrelevant. The message that Larry has been talking about for years, what the Democrats have done to the black family, the, re the reality related to systemic racism. Uh, these, th these ideas are things that he's been the master at teaching American Americans. And I think it's incredible that he's even thinking about it. So Newsweek wrote a piece on it. It sounds like it's gonna happen. Talk radio host and filmmaker Larry Elder's political ambitions have turned presidential and he has a staff of advisors preparing a possible run at the Republican nomination for a man once accused of being the black face of white supremacy. He told Newsweek that his decision to run for the presidential nomination would have nothing to do with whether former President Donald Trump runs again and was more about drawing attention to what he says in an, is an underappreciated problem in America fatherlessness, crime, spending, inflation, the war on oil and gas, the overrun borders. Of course, I want to discuss that, but also what's not talked about. The destruction of the nuclear intact family, Elder said in the 45 minute interview. Women are incentivized to marry the government and men are incentivized to abandon their financial responsibilities. And that's led to 70% of black kids entering the world without a father married to a mother, while it was 25% in 1965. So look guys, whether, whether Larry has true ambitions to become the president or whether he wants to get in the mix and get on that debate stage uh, so that he can spread the message that he has been spreading for basically almost four decades in the public eye, uh, this is really, really good. More and more good people getting involved, whether it's Hey, guys like Elon Musk buying things like Twitter to fix things, or guys like Larry Elder getting out of the radio game that he's been in forever, now moving on to the digital frontier where he's doing a show and then saying, hey, and I'm also gonna throw my hat in the ring and run for president. This is good. And uh, it reminded me a little bit, I thought this is a little throwback for you. This is a little over a year ago. Uh, this is one of the events that I opened for Larry Elder for. This was a little north of Los Angeles. And the reason I'm showing it to you, it's about a minute long, is because it was, there was such a fun atmosphere there. They were calling him the black face of white supremacy. You'll see all the people in the crowd because they kind of digged him and it didn't matter what color their skin was and it didn't matter what gender they were or sexuality or the rest of it. But there was like American flags and a joy and, and it did not work out in Cali, but maybe there was something being seeded at that time that could go national. So this is about a year ago, me and Larry Elder. Nobody is sweating like Gavin Newsom right this very moment. Maxwell, where are you? I'm Don't hanging with your mom at the Larry Elder rally. Woo! Great lady, by the way, really fantastic. Gavin Newsom is tweeting this and he's bringing in his spectacularly loved uh, surrogates like Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar. Yeah, okay. He brought in a fake Native American from Boston to tell us how we should live, okay. And what they're afraid of is that Larry Elder from the hood who went to a public school will be able to make the case to black and brown people, you are being betrayed, you are being you, you're being manipulated. Anyway, the point of all that, guys, is to show you that good people are getting involved and there is something so good in America and we, we let it go for too long, but we're about to grab it back. And I think that is incredibly exciting. It should, it should be lighting a fire 
in you these, these final seven days before this election. Like we have a chance, whether it is to get back to that cold open with those kids in 1984 where shaving cream in New York City was the biggest issue with the cops as opposed to now where you're, you know, grandma's being pushed in front of the subway or the post-racial world that most of us live in that Larry Elder has been fighting for for so long, but the woke and the Democrats have tried to uh, completely reverse. It's like, we can really get it back and we can get to something that was something we had and we didn't know how precious it was. Uh, I am going to contrast Larry Elder and his message uh, with former President Barack Obama in just a moment. Uh, but let me talk to you guys a little bit about what the blaze is doing for election night. You know, election night is just around the corner and the stakes have never been higher for the midterms, in case that isn't clear. Uh, several races across the country have gotten very interesting in the past couple weeks. Will the Republicans be able to win a Senate seat in Washington state of all places? Is Kathy Hochul really in trouble in New York? Yes. Uh, will voters punish Gretchen Whitmer for her COVID lockdown insanity and finally give her the boot? I hope so. Uh, there's a ton to cover this election cycle and we've got you covered. Stu Bergier, who kind of serves as the Blaze Media's resident physiologist. Is that a word? Uh, that's just a fancy word that means someone who studies elections. Put together a comprehensive guide to let you know exactly what you need to look for on election night. Head over to theblaze.com slash election guide to receive a free copy of The Blaze Media's ultimate guide to the midterms delivered to your inbox. Again, that's theblaze.com slash election guide, and we will send you everything you need to know to be ready for the big election night. And now back to me, and yes, I think it is going to be a good night, and I will present evidence over the course of the next 45 minutes to prove it. Anyway, let's compare and contrast Larry Elder. You know what Larry Elder believes. He believes in freedom. He believes in limited government. He thinks America is pretty good, that kind of stuff. He doesn't believe in neo-racism. Uh, and then there is former President Barack Obama. Now, oh, Barack Obama has been pretty quiet over the past couple of years, and I will give him credit for that. There were moments that he stepped in some things, but you know, usually ex-presidents, they kind of get out of the way. Whether they agree or disagree with the guy that follows them, they usually get out of the way. Sometimes they, they come back when there's national emergencies, right? When Bill Clinton and George W. Bush came back together after Hurricane Katrina. Like there's some moments of that, or when you know a, a statesman usually from another country uh, passes away, they show up at funerals, that sort of thing. So he's mostly been away, but they're busting him out this week, big time. So they got him somehow. He left his 30 acre oceanfront mansion in Martha's Vineyard, where by the way, they have no illegal immigrants because they cannot have them in Martha's Vineyard. They can have them in Texas border towns, but no, 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 not those good Democrats of Martha's Vineyard. Anyway, they busting out Obama to campaign for some of these Democrats because they realize it's going to be bad. And he, that's the kitchen sink. Obama is the kitchen sink. Remember Hope and Change Man? It's like if Hope and Change Man can't save us, we're really, really screwed. So Obama's given a bunch of rallies. Uh, here's a little video. You, you hear the Republicans talk a lot about crime right now. How violent crime has gone up over the last seven years, by the way. They act like it just happened just last year. As if, like, the, the, the previous president wasn't there. <laughs> and by the way, it, it, it didn't just happen in so-called blue states. Turns out it's gone up in conservative rural states, too, where, where Republicans are in charge. But they, they, they don't mention that in the ads. So here's the question. Who will fight to keep you and your family safe? Man, he was supposed to be hope and change and really all he turned out to be was more of the same. It, it, it is so true. He is so deeply disingenuous. So first off, he's being very glib about crime in general, right? Because it's he knows that the Democrats are basically in charge of everything right now. So there's a glibness to it. Like, oh, they're focusing on crime as if we shouldn't think about crime, right? And we shouldn't worry about that. Now, first, he's also mentioning that it's Republican states that have some of this crime. Now, that is true, of course, but all top 10 cities where crime is the highest right now, where murder rates are up and, and larceny and all of the bad stuff, rape and general mayhem. They're all Democrat run cities. You guys know it. Everyone knows it. New York City, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, the list goes on and on. What he of course also left out there is when he's saying, well, they forget about uh, the, the my predecessor and what was going on with him. Uh, yeah, it was Democrats and Antifa and BLM, the base of the Democrat party that was burning down the cities, 
right? It was your guys, Obama. It was the guys who vote and support for you, uh, for you, right? Like that is, it's just true and it's obvious. And we all know that crime is way up under Biden than it ever was under Trump. It is absolutely true. I'm actually getting some info here on the fly uh, from Phoenix of the top 25 highest crime cities in the United States. Only one has a Republican mayor that happens to be Jacksonville, Florida. So the other 24 of 25 are Democrat run cities. Is there a connection between say Democrat policies and crime? Do you think that might be something that we should look into? Yeah, uh, and you guys know it, like you, you just absolutely know it. Uh, anyway, he was, that was a rally in Michigan. He continued uh, to give a very strange defense of Gretchen Whitmer because she's in a lot of trouble right now. Tudor Dixon is, is picking up a lot of steam. We showed you some videos from the debate. Uh, Whitmer, she was one of the biggest proponents of lockdowns. She, she literally banned people from gardening in their backyards. Uh, you may remember that we sent, I sent a whole bunch of people in Michigan seeds so that they could plant things because they could not buy them in areas around Detroit. Uh, so Obama somehow figured out a way to defend Gretchen Whitmer. You don't want a lot of wild, crazy talk. You just want somebody who's doing their job. That's what Governor Mid Whitmer is focused on. I, I mean, imagine if, 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 if you, know, you hire your plumber. You got, a, you, you got an overflowing toilet. It's a problem. <laughs> he comes in and you know, you're waiting for the toilet to be fixed. He said, have you heard about the latest conspiracy of the lizard people, and he starts talking to you about all this stuff. We gotta do something about that. You'd be like, no, 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 I, I, I just want you to fix my toilet. Isn't it true, like, the hope and change thing, how he just became, he's just more of the same. That's all that he is. What, what plumbers are showing up to somebody's house in Michigan and talking about lizard people instead of doing their jobs? Now, if you mean that Republicans generally have jobs, and go ahead and do the things that a lot of your supporters don't want to do, like maybe being a plumber, I guess you're probably right on that. Um, Gretchen Whitmer was just doing her job, just doing her job when she was shutting down the state, just doing her job when she told people they couldn't get on boats and she jumped on her family boat for her, her husband's birthday party uh, without masks. Like, what are you talking about? So Obama is just one of them. That is all he is at this point. Now I get it, he's pulling the strings on the, on the Biden machine too, but Man, what a disappointment he turned out to be. Uh, fortunately, not everybody in the crowd was loving Barack Obama. And when he's not reading off the teleprompter, you know, he's quite a good orator, right? I'll give him credit on that. But when he gets off that prompter, he, he definitely struggles. And uh, the crowd was not having it. Well, at least some people in the crowd were not having it. Right now I'm talking. You'll have a chance to talk sometime soon. We don't have to interrupt each other. You don't have to shout each other down. It's not a good way to do business. It's not, you wouldn't do that at a workplace. If, you wouldn't just interrupt people in the middle of a conversation. It's not how we do things. And this is part of the point that I want to make. Just basic civility and courtesy works. And that's what we want to try to encourage. So, listen, that's okay. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Quiet down, quiet down. Look, it, listen. Hey, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. This is, listen everybody. Hey, y'all up there, pay attention. Here's what happens, listen. I mean, he was really losing control of that thing. And you know, he goes into that fake accent and he does all his very, you can see they're like trained coordinated moves to kind of look cool and everything. Look, I'm not for, for people coming in and shouting down speakers, right? It has happened to me many, many times. But when Obama's up there, this is a conversation. You'll get your chance to talk. No, it isn't. It, it, it's a lecture. You're, you're not there to, Obama's gonna like walk out after like, where's that guy who had that issue to spew? I, I'd like to talk to him. 
Like, come on, come on. But I, I just really think people are not buying it anymore. There's this, he's able to do, because he is, again, a skilled orator, he's able to do this folksy thing that makes it seem like he's the good guy. So that's what he's doing there. Like, that guy's the bad guy because he's yelling down and we just need, we just need more civility. Except he's the same person from the same party that runs around calling half the country Nazis and racists and he's gone all in on the woke stuff. So it's like if you're if you're doing that and demonizing half the country, but you do it civilly because you know your shirt's tucked in nicely and you got nice teeth and your body language is kind of good, it's like, no, we can kind of see through that. And by the way, we can also see through the rest of the nonsense that Obama's been pushing for a long time. This is a video, and this is gonna link us to the theme for the rest of the show. This is a video back in April of 2022. So this year, this is only about six months ago, uh, where Barack Obama was in essence calling for social media censorship, that the Democrats are losing the narrative, and yeah, we better stop those lizard people. What does still nag at me though, was my failure to fully appreciate at the time, just how susceptible we had become to lies and conspiracy theories. Despite having spent years being a target of disinformation myself, social media companies already make choices about what is or is not allowed on their platforms and how that content appears, both explicitly through content moderation and implicitly through algorithms. The problem is we often don't know what principles govern those decisions. In some cases, industry standards may replace or substitute for regulation, but regulation has to be part of the answer. Beyond that, tech companies need to be more transparent about how they operate. As citizens, we have to take it upon ourselves to become better consumers of news, looking at sources, thinking before we share, and teaching our kids to become critical thinkers who know how to evaluate sources and separate opinion from fact. All right, I get it. You show that to the average person and it all kind of sounds right. We want to watch out for misinformation, but it's his party, his corporate news, his big tech people who have been the main suppressors of information that didn't go with the narrative, right? Um, it is his people that have been coordinating, and we've got evidence of it, with big tech to silence people. And this is the problem. So the major story that dropped yesterday, and just let's just see how the corporate media covers or does not cover this one, is that in essence, the FBI and the CIA have been working with big tech. We all kind of suspected it, but yeah, it turns out that it's true. We've got some info from Breitbart here. Executives from Facebook and Twitter, including the recently fired head of trust and safety, Vijaya Gade, that was the woman who was just fired from Twitter, held regular meetings with the Department of Homeland Security to discuss censorship on a wide range of topics, including the withdrawal from Afghanistan, coronavirus, and racial justice, according to leaked documents. The information came to light via leaks to The Intercept, as well as documents and minutes revealed through Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt's lawsuit filed against the Biden administration that alleges government collusion with big tech to suppress Americans' first, right, first Amendment rights. The report also reveals an official process for the government to flag misinformation to Facebook via The Intercept. There is also a formalized process for government officials to directly flag content on Facebook or Instagram and request that it be throttled or suspended through a special Facebook portal that requires a government or law enforcement email to use. At the time of writing, the content request system at facebook.com slash x takedowns slash login is still live. DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and Meta, the parent company of Facebook did not respond to a request for comment. The FBI declined to comment. Some of the meetings between social media representatives and the government included Kate Starbird, the leftist professor who leads the Election Integrity Partnership. In June, the same DHS advisory committee of CISA, which includes Twitter head of legal policy, trust and safety, Vijaya Gade, and University of Washington professor Kate Starbird drafted a report to the CISA director calling for an expansive role for the agency in shaping the information ecosystem. 
The report called on the agency to closely monitor social media platforms of all sizes, mainstream media, cable news, hyper-partisan media, talk radio, and other online resources. They argued that the agency needed to take steps to halt the spread of false and misleading information with a focus on information that undermines key democratic institutions such as the courts or by other sectors such as the financial system or public health measures. Okay, guys, this is seriously massive. This is not nothing, this is big, okay? The government was working with big tech. We all kind of thought it. It all felt very weird. Why did that Hunter Biden thing disappear? Why could people not only not share the story and the New York Post, a place of journalism for over a hundred years, was suspended from Twitter, but if you took the link from their website and shared it in your private messages on Twitter, your direct messages, suddenly it would disappear. Why is it that we know obviously some people uh, are blown off Twitter. <laughs> They're blown off Twitter like Donald Trump, like Project Veritas, because they go against the narrative and it very rarely happens to lefties. The idea that the government, it wasn't even just about COVID and elections, it was also about people who were arguing against the narrative related to Afghanistan. I mean, this is deep, deep stuff. And really think about it. What is the First Amendment, guys? You all know it. I have a bright audience, right? This isn't MSNBC over here. The First Amendment means that the government cannot infringe on your right to free speech. So if you were using your speech on a platform like Twitter and the government was coming in and censoring it, shadow banning it, deleting it, whatever they were doing with it, a government agent was acting and infringing on your First Amendment right to free speech, this is this is. Huge, like huge, huge, huge. Here's a journalist over at uh, The Intercept uh, who's got a bit more. His name's Lee Fang. The emails and documents show close collaboration between Department of Homeland Security and private sector. Twitter's Vijaya Gade, fired by Elon Musk last week, met monthly with Department of Homeland Security to discuss censorship plans. Microsoft exec texted Department of Homeland Security, platforms have got to get comfortable with government. And then here it goes into uh, the text right here. Thanks so much, really appreciate it. And sorry, I didn't ring last week. Think you were on a call this week? Just trying to get us a place, get us in a place where the Fed can work with platforms to better understand the mid slash disinfo trends so relevant agencies can try to pre-bunk, debunk as useful. Not our mission, but was looking to a coordinated role. So not every DA is independently reaching out to platforms, which would cause a lot of chaos. Was on the call, the coordination is greatly appreciated, was disappointed that platforms, including us, didn't offer more. We'll get there and sector leadership had zero questions. We'll get there and that kind of leadership really helps. Platforms have got to get more comfortable with government. It's really interesting how hesitant they remain. Again, Microsoft included. This is the woman who is in charge of trust and safety at Twitter. The very same woman who Elon Musk fired this week, who is going to really try to get her golden parachute, which could be like 20 million bucks. But he's saying he fired her for cause. She is the one that is personally, personally responsible for booting Trump off Twitter. There she is texting about how she wants more government coordination and what else can they do? So the government and big tech was working in cahoots to silence you, but not just you, me. Remember this tweet? I keep showing you this one and I had a feeling something weird was going on with it way back when. This was me back in July of 2021, not this July, a year ago, July. They want a federal vaccine mandate for vaccines, which are clearly not working as promised just weeks ago. People are getting and transmitting COVID despite the vax. Plus now they're prepping us for booster shots. A sane society would take pause. We do not live in a sane society. Everything I said in that tweet in July of 2021 was true. Vaccines were not working as promised. They were clearly pushing us towards boosters and mandates were coming. That got me suspended from Twitter. So the question is, and I'm, I, I do this all the time, this is not to make this about me, but it is a perfect example of what the high hell is going on here between the government and big tech. Did Twitter, Vijaya Gade, 
and whoever her minions were at Twitter, did they independently decide that that tweet was misinformation or it was scary or disinformation or whatever it might be, and they as a, as a company decided to take it down or were they contacted by the government? It sounds very possible that it was the government. They had this secret login. We know they were doing all this coordination. Did someone from the government say, ah, well, Ruben just uh, leaked out what we all know to be true, but it's a little early for the truth to get out there. We can't just have the truth getting out there in real time. You gotta take this thing down. In which case, my First Amendment rights were violated. I don't know, I actually contacted a couple lawyers this morning, like I would love to know what actually is the recourse if your First Amendment vi uh, rights are violated, meaning it's like, can, I, I'm not interested in doing this, this isn't the point, but like, can you sue Twitter? Can you sue the government? I mean, certainly it seems like some people from the government would have to step down if your job is to defend the Constitution of the United States and you do something that is in direct violation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, you got a problem on your hand. And by the way, again, guys, and this is what, why something is so cool, uh, something so cool is happening right now. A lot of us have been talking about all of this for a long time. A lot of us have been talking about how no one really was, was into the woke and it, it all felt fake and, and none of this made any sense. But now it's becoming obvious that it was all true. Uh, and Senator Ted Cruz, I think, has been one of the leaders on this from a, from a governmental perspective. Uh, here he is, this is, uh, what is this, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz asking then Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, he has since stepped down, why the New York Post story about Hunter Biden was censored. Why did Twitter make the decision to censor the New York Post? Uh, we had a hack materials policy. Um, that we when was that worked. policy adopted? Uh, in 2018, I believe. In 2018, go ahead. What was, what, what was the policy? So the policy is around um, limiting the spread of materials uh, that are hacked. Um, we didn't want Twitter to be a distributor for hacked materials. Um, we found that the New York Post, because it showed the direct materials, screenshots of the direct materials, and it was unclear how those were attained, that it felt that it fell under this policy. Now, we, so in your view, if it's unclear the source of, uh, of a document, and in this instance, the New York Post documented what it said the source was, which it said it was a, uh, a laptop owned by Hunter Biden that had been turned into a re re repair store. So they weren't hiding what they claimed to be the source. Is it, Are, is it your position that Twitter, when you can't tell the source, blocks, blocks press stories? No, not at all. Um, we, our, our team made a fast decision uh, the enforcement action, however, of blocking URLs, both in tweets and uh, in DM, in direct messages, we believe was incorrect. Okay, so at the end there, we believe it was incorrect what we did. Yeah, a year and a half later after Biden got elected and all that, uh, Cruz did a great, great job there because it is very clear that the Biden laptop was not hacked. Hacked would have been that, that Hunter Biden would have been snort, or do you snort crack or do you smoke crack, I guess? I guess you smoke crack. He would have been smoking crack and on his porn websites and he would have been do, doing his thing, you know, doing this, or I guess it would have been one-handed. He would have been doing his thing. And then the, some hackers would have broke into his Wi-Fi or whatever and stolen the information. As Ted Cruz lays out there, that we know that's not the case. And it was known from day one. Hunter Biden literally brought the laptop to the repair shop. So there was no hack. There was no hack. Uh, so, so the question really for Jack Dorsey, and again, he does not work at Twitter anymore, and maybe he wisely stepped down knowing that a shitstorm was a coming, uh, is, hey, who actually led to this decision? Did you get a call? Did someone from the government log into a special uh, account that they have, you know, a special place where they set up so that government officials are able to contact people at Facebook and Twitter and everything else to get rid of certain stories. To admit two years later, after you got the results of the election that you wanted, that, oh, maybe we kind of screwed up, uh, that ain't good enough. But that being said, Elon Musk is now in charge of Twitter and I think will expose a lot of this nonsense and Jack Dorsey is long gone. The other interesting thing about all of this is that they've been doing it right in front of our faces. How many times have I shown you guys this video? This is Jen Psaki when she was White House press secretary. Again, this is July of 2021, right around, I think this was within a week of when I sent out that tweet that I was suspended for. This is Jen Psaki admitting that the White House coordinates with big tech to silence you. 
this is a big issue of misinformation, specifically on the pandemic. In terms of actions, Alex, that uh, we have taken or we're working to take, I should say, from the federal government, uh, we've increased uh, disinformation research and tracking uh, within the Surgeon General's office. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. Flagging problematic posts. The government is saying to big tech, hey, we don't like this. Like, uh, here's a guy that says maybe the vaccine doesn't work. We can't have people saying that. We flag it. Now, the interesting use of the word flag, the implication is we didn't force them to do anything. But imagine, first off, this was before, obviously, this new information was exposed where they are coordinating together and they're admitting it. But even putting that aside, if the government is constantly calling you as a business owner and being like, you're doing something a little bit wrong there. Do you think you might start doing something a little bit differently? And then perhaps that would be a violation of your First Amendment, right? The government could kind of be, keep calling you up, being like, you know, we don't like what you're doing there when you're selling those shoes that way. We, we're not big fans of that. Uh, we're not telling you not to do it, but, you know, we just want you to know we're not fans. Sort of like they could call a tech company and be like, you know, we're not telling you to take these things down, uh, but, you know, we're just letting you know we're watching. And, uh, you know, we happen to be the guys that are in charge of breaking up companies and we look into taxing people and auditing people. You think that maybe there's something there? Yeah, I think there's maybe something there. Uh, anyway, uh, the clown show at the televised mental institution, MSNBC, they are freaking out right now because as more of this gets exposed, their nonsense and their corporate coordination with big tech and the Democrats to silence you and confuse you when it came to truth and honesty and reality related to COVID and so much more, that is crumbling in front of their eyes right now. So what do they have to do? They have to make sure that you think that Elon and Twitter is a violent attack on democracy. On Pizzagate cabal style stuff. The idea that the world is secretly run by this new world order uh, and it is trying to censor you. It's trying to prevent the world from seeing what's really going on. And that Nancy Pelosi and people like that, those people uh, in the QAnon spaces right now, those people are at the top of that sphere. They are at the top of that pecking order when it comes to how people believe in conspiracy theories. And I, I do wanna stress this. First of all, lies on the internet move faster than the truth. And that's in part why there are all these safeguards that Elon Musk is trying to take down on Twitter right now. There was this world building on the pro-Trump internet. What could be the opposite of reality here? And the opposite of reality they came up with was these two people were having a lover's quarrel in a house and the police sort of intruded on us. It's fundamentally incorrect. It was pushed by the richest man in the world. And then yesterday, it was pushed by Donald Trump Jr., who posted a picture of underwear and a hammer and said it's a Halloween costume for Paul Pelosi. If we don't cut this out right now, the, not just the normalization of violence, but the idea that reality can't even exist anymore because it cannot catch up to the lies on the internet. I'm not a scholar on authoritarian history. But I've, let, I've read Hannah Arendt. I've read all of these people. Mm -hmm. This is how it gets really bad. This is the start of something that gets really, really bad. If you are getting the guardrails off the truth, where it literally cannot catch up to the lies on the internet because of how the pipes work, how the system works, because of the incentives of the richest people in the world, then that's how you lose your democracy. Guys, this guy's freaking out about losing democracy because of QAnon and what people are saying online. Well, there's a guy by the name of Kyle Becker. Have we had Kyle on the show? I think maybe we had him on one Friday panel once. We should get him back on. He's an actual journalist. He does a great job of exposing media nonsense. That's what he's mostly focused on. And right before the show today, I saw he tweeted out a list of conspiracy theories that the mainstream media pushed. So here you have this guy, that, that guy, by the way, Ben Collins there, his, his title at NBC News is he's on the dystopian beat. He's always looking for misinformation. He's one of the biggest peddlers of misinformation uh, that exists, right? Because he's just doing it at a, he has a corporate desk. So whatever he says is misinformation is misinformation. So anyway, Kyle Becker put out this awesome list and here are some mainstream media hoaxes that these people sitting at that desk that MSNBC and The View and CNN and Washington Post and a whole bunch more put out there. You tell me how many of these tr uh, turned out to be true. This is, this is fantastic. Russia collusion, Trump called neo-Nazis fine people, Jussie Smollett, Bubba Wallace garage pole, the Covington kids were racist, Governor Whitnap Whitmer kidnapping plot, Kavanaugh was a rapist, Trump pee tape, COVID lab leak was a conspiracy theory, border agents whipped migrants, Trump saved nuclear secrets at Mar-a-Lago, the steel dossier, Russian bounties on US soldiers in Afghanistan, Trump said drinking bleach would fight COVID, Muslim travel ban, 
Hunter Biden's laptop was Russian disinformation. Andrew Cuomo was the best COVID leader. Trump built cages for migrant kids. Uh, Suleimani, the Iranian general, was an austere religious scholar. Trump overfed koi fish in Japan. That was a good one. Remember when he dumped the thing? Uh, Build back, be Bill back better will pay for itself. Trump ca tax cuts benefited only the rich. Cloth masks prevent COVID. If you get vaccinated, you won't catch COVID. An SUV killed parade marchers, as opposed to the guy who was driving it. Trump used tear gas to clear crowd for a Bible photo. Don't say gay was in a bill. Putin price hike. Ivermectin is a horse to wormer and not for humans. Mostly peaceful protesters. Trump overpowered Secret Service for the Wheel of the Beast. That was a good one. Uh, Officer, Officer Sicknick was murdered by protesters on January 6th. January 6th was an insurrection. Trump mocked a reporter's disability. And BYU students hurled racist insults at Duke volleyball player. This is just a quick list he put up together today. Good work, Kyle Becker. These are the people that have spread all of this nonsense and misinformation. And then they have coordinated as we have all pushed back on it and going something in reality is not matching up with what we're seeing online and in the news. Uh, then they went ahead and they tried to make sure that enough of us would be shadow banned and censored into oblivion, but something ain't working anymore. Uh, so let's go back to crime, misinformation, and conspiracy theories leading into this election, because that's what this is all about at this point. That's why it feels like things are being ramped up like crazy. Uh, here is New York governor, who nobody voted for, Kathy Hochul, uh, saying that it's Republicans who are just somehow using propaganda to make you think you're not safe in democratic states. Governor Al, these are master manipulators. They have this conspiracy going all across America to try and convince people that in democratic states, they're not as safe. Well, guess what? They're also not only election deniers, they're data deniers. The data shows that shootings and murders are down in our state by 15%, even in New York City, down 20% on Long Island, where Lee Zeldin comes from. Unbelievable. Un they, they lie right to your face. But again, this is one where I would say to you guys, you don't always need the stats and the polls to show everything. We can read you, I mean, we've done it a million times talking about the crime in Democrat run cities. How about you just go to one of those cities? Go to New York City as I did about a month ago. And it is not New York City of old. It is not, it does not feel safe. It does not feel safe. When you see people being pushed onto subways, that the cops know that they're not gonna be backed up. So then we have all these cops retiring and then unqualified people that are becoming cops because they just have to take anyone to be a cop. I mean, there are huge, huge problems in Democrat run cities, but she, she's a liar who is spending too much time getting Botox and not enough time actually trying to solve problems. Uh, but here's another one. Here's a gem. Here's a gem of a woman for you. Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, Ah, it was Halloween yesterday, so it's worth showing you a Lori Lightfoot video. Enjoy. Hi, Mayor. Um, you introduced a measure today that would change the way both the mayor, the city clerk, and the city treasurer get pay raises, capping them annually at 5%. Um, why the change there, and um, why is that a good use of city funds? Well, to be clear, the ordinance that was introduced today would put um, the mayor... Uh, the city treasurer and the clerk in line with all the other elected officials regarding a cost of living increase. It's not a salary increase. So I want to make sure that's clear. Man. I, I sometimes admire their ability to lie. It's not that I want to lie, but it's like, it's a skill in and of itself. It's, a, it's an evil devilish skill, but it is a skill. Did you catch what happened there? She in the midst of everything that is going on in Chicago. Can I get the numbers on the amount of people shot and killed in Chicago this weekend, please? Um, which you will not hear about on mainstream media uh, while we're getting that number. What she's doing right now is giving herself a raise. That's what she's mostly focused on right now. She's giving herself a raise as Chicago is purging people, as people are being shot left and right. But she wants you to know it's not a raise. It's not a raise, even though her salary is, if guys, if I was to increase your salary, what would you call it? A uh, raise, right. It's, but when she does it, it's not a raise. It's a cost of living thing, okay? That's what it is when it's her. Do we have some numbers on Chicago murders and deaths? We got anything? You're trying to, you gotta carry the one. It's a lot, right? It's a lot, we're getting something. 60 people were shot in Chicago this past weekend. Only five killed. Only five killed. Pretty good. Lori Lightfoot, you deserve a raise. Only five were killed in your city this week. Anyway, what the other, the other thing, of course, that they'll do is they will always 
obfuscate, right? They will confuse you about what the real issues are and they will take things that are nothing and make them seem huge and then they will take huge things and make them seem like they're nothing. I gotta show you the ladies of The View. Do we have the, yeah, here we go. It's the harpies of The View. They did their Halloween show yesterday and look at the way they abuse. I mean, this is child abuse. Enjoy. Okay, so one of the hugest topics that you guys talked about this year, the raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. Yes. Trump as a toilet with our FBI agents. <laughs> oh, I love that. These people really are disgusting. Like what kid, like as if a kid thought of that, I get it. It's all theater, it's a show, okay, fine. It's just gross, the politicization of everything with these people, it's all they have, it's all they care about. You know what kids usually wanna be at? We were out with the kids yesterday, we were all skeletons, we were a skeleton family, we, we were the skeleton crew, that's what we said, we were the skeleton crew. There were a lot of skeletons out here. Um, but there were, there were we, we saw some Batman, we saw some Supermans, we saw some Star Wars people, we saw some witches, uh, Dracula, that sort of thing. We didn't see any Donald Trumps uh, as toilets. Strange, it's strange that kids wouldn't, re Mommy, I want to be at the Mar-a-Lago raid. <laughs> so what is it that voters actually care about right now? Do they care about the, Mommy, I want to be a Mar-a-Lago raid, or do they care about crime and the economy and all of that stuff. Well, here is Republican New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu taking it to Chuck Todd on just that. Why are you supporting an election denialist? And, and do you think the infl inflation issue is enough uh, to, comp to sort of rationalize support for somebody who thinks school buses of voters are gonna show up in New Hampshire? Yeah. Yeah, let me tell you, you, you're in a bubble, man. I love you, Chuck, but you are in a bubble. If you think anybody is talking about what happened in 2020 or talking about Mar-a-Lago and all that, I know the press loves to talk about it. People are talking about what is happening in their pocketbooks every single day. I, look, I get when that, When they have governor. to buy groceries or fill should up gas or right now. You well, that, that should far be prioritized to, yeah, over election should they be? Okay. How could they? Of course. Oh my gosh, Chuck, this is hitting people. They're having trouble paying their mortgage. They're having trouble making car payments because of bad policies out of Washington. Should they be? That is, look, the beauty of the American system is every voter has the right mm -hmm. and almost the responsibility to be selfish with their vote, to vote in terms of what is best for their totally family, agree. the better choice for schools, better economic opportunity. And that's exactly what's going to happen in a week, which is why Hassan's going to get fired. A whole bunch of these Democrats are going to get fired because frankly, folks that think that we're war that the average voter is worried about 2020. The average voter, it, it's a serious issue, of course, but it is not what people are going to be voting on in the next week. And that's kind of has baffled me through this whole campaign season. So Nunu is pretty solid. I, I don't know a ton about the guy, but that's, that's the truth. People don't care about this election nonsense. What we want are safe and secure elections. And we want officials in charge that are going to make sure that say you have to have an ID, that you can't double vote, that we're going to have secure elections when it comes to mail-in ballots and you can't actually see through the envelope and see who people voted for, which is exactly what we had in California when I voted there last year. Um, but Chuck Todd, I mean, he should just put, just put on, I get it, it's meet the press. Just put under your name, man, Democrat operative. Just put it on, I like Democrats. I'm Chuck Todd. I dig Democrat stuff. And then the show would feel a little bit more honest, right? Of course it would, but, but this, is, this is what they're gonna keep running with. And by the way, after the red wave uh, next week, one week from today, trust me, you are gonna be allowed to question elections again. And trust me, they will unleash violence on the streets again when they feel it's appropriate, when they need to turn that knob. So you think about things a little bit differently to get, rile up the base again. They're telling us already, let's not forget Hillary Clinton a few days ago and then hit Chelsea Clinton on The View two days ago. Hillary, what did she say? She has literally evidence that the far right MAGA Republicans are planning on stealing the election. It's odd, she didn't show the evidence. Why do I keep printing out all this paper? We have all this paper here, we're always printing things. Hillary didn't bring the paper, very odd. Uh, what do Americans really care about? Well. There's a guy down in here, here in Florida who knows what's up. We also believe that, and, I, and my wife and I are sensitive to it just because we have a five, four and two year old at home 
And you think about raising kids now, I, 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 not that it was ever easy, but when I was growing up, there were just way less things that like, could really be bad in front of kids, it seemed like. Now, you know, parents got to worry about all these different influences, and we just believe that as a parent, you, know, you should have the, the ability to send your kid to school, they should be able to watch cartoons, play with friends, just be kids without having some agenda shoved down their throat. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? Of course it's the truth. We want kids to be able to be kids. We don't want them indoctrinated, whether it's this gender or sexuality stuff or this neo-racism or to grow up hating their parents, hating their family, hating the country. And that is why Florida is thriving. That is why every freaking day on MSNBC and on all of these other shows, they're constantly attacking Florida because we are showing them how it's done and it's done right here. And let me just say something else about, about Florida because I, I've mentioned this before, but it's not just that we have a good governor and the policies are right. What happens after good policy, maybe it's a little bit of chicken or the egg, actually. I think you could probably argue it both ways. But what happens either after or before good policy, I guess good people vote in good policy, so you can do it either way. But then the spirit of community starts spreading. I can tell you from being out on the streets yesterday during Halloween, it was, there was so much joy. There was so much celebration. So many people saying hi to each other, having a blast, smiling, introducing each other, uh, introducing people to each other. We're obviously new in town here. We happen to be a family with two dads. Oddly, I didn't get eggs or shaving creams or have anyone scream at us or anything. People were thrilled to meet us and very happy and it was just great and we met all the neighbor kids and all of that stuff. That was in stark contrast to what I would see on Halloween in LA where people are afraid of each other, well, especially during COVID, you know. So, so freedom, freedom is so fundamental to being a human that once you have it, you kind of forget about it because you shouldn't have to think about it all the time because it's, it's, in, it's within us, right? But you have to elect people that will help defend it. That's what we've done here and that's why the Democrats are freaking out right now because they don't care about freedom, they care about power. And that is a stark, stark difference. And what does that all lead to? Well, Joe Rogan, who has a small, uh, I'm told this is an internet web show and some sort of podcast or something, uh, he now has come around. This is a guy who was a Hollywood guy, Californian, fled California, moved to Texas. Uh, definitely not what you'd call a uh, traditional Republican as he's a mushroom eating, MMA fighting, ayahuasca doing, uh, you know, muscle bound meathead or something like that. Uh, well, he knows that the red waves are coming. The red wave that's coming is going to be like the elevator doors opening up in The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think. I think people are just like, what the fuck are you saying? You're, they're making Republicans. I don't know how they're doing it. It's, I had a family member who is an, who's a boomer and a diehard liberal. And they told me when I was home this summer that they would vote for DeSantis. And I'm like, how did you lose this person? Yeah. How did you lose this person? This is a this is a like go to the ballot and vote blue no matter what. And you've lost even the the boomers. I love Bridget. She's been on the show many times. She's a, she's a dear friend of mine. I know how they did it. You know how they did it? They would not stop with the woke stuff. It's as simple as that. The liberals would not defend liberalism. This is something I've been talking about for a long time. So all of the good people, the moderates, the Joe Rogan types, the people who don't care about politics that much. Finally, first they look at their wallets and they go, none of this makes sense, right? Elon Musk has to move Tesla from California to Texas because of tax purposes. Rogan signs a $200 million deal. He's just looking at the numbers. And then he goes, okay, Democrat run states have massive taxes. Texas has no income tax. Well, that's one part. Then you realize you don't want uh, your kid's second grade teacher talking to them about chopping their genitals off. That seems like a pretty much of a throwaway to me. Like we don't want that. So if you don't want that, you'd be more inclined to move to a red state. If you want your kids to be taught that America is actually fundamentally decent. And how about we have an honest assessment of what our founding is and what our history is? Well, you could do that in certain red states, but it's getting increasingly harder and harder to do in blue states and in blue cities. So you might want to blow up the Department of Education. You might want to have less centralized control. You might realize that, say, Randy Weingarten, who's the head of the teachers union, is a Democrat activist who, for some reason, was in Ukraine two weeks ago. There's a, so much weirdness here, but it's all kind of obvious if you've been paying attention, and I know you guys have. And that's why I hope Joe Rogan is right. That, that scene in The Shining, right, and the, and the blood just rushes right in. Um, it's like, that's what we need. 
at the moment. And then we can get back to where we started at the top of the show with a bunch of kids running around New York City and the cops are worried about too much shaving cream because crime is pretty low at that point, right? Like we can get back to something normal. I know we can because it's here where I live right now. And it's not just the policies, it's the people as well. So that's, that's where we're at. It's one week from today, people. We'll be voting in person, by the way. You guys, you guys didn't do mail-ins, right? We're all gonna go in person? We're, okay, we're all gonna go in person on election day. So I'm gonna go that morning and I will come and do the show live uh, right after that. Uh, a couple comments from the locals community and then we got a cold close for you. Amy says, I cannot wait for election day. My husband took the next day off work so we can stay up late to watch the results come in across the nation. Well. That is fantastic. Hopefully there won't be any pipe bursts. Remember what happened on election night when uh, Trump was running up for re-election? A pipe burst in Philadelphia. Next thing you know, five states disappear off the map and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get kicked off YouTube today. Things have been pretty good for us lately. Uh, Chuck says, Larry Elder would severely limit the amount of and types of attacks the left can use without completely outing themselves as complete racist hypocrites. Well, yes, for sure. However, they're so deep in the mire and the muck that they do it nonetheless, right? So that's why the LA Times dared to write a headline, the black face of white supremacy in the middle of his campaign. Or how about when some crazy Democrat lunatic put on a monkey costume and threw something at him while he was in Venice Beach. Uh, and for some reason, MSNBC and CNN didn't pick that up, right? Like there is no depth because they only care about power to the inconsistencies of what they will talk about and won't talk about. And that's why we just gotta, we gotta be a little bit better. We gotta vote in the right people. And then, and then as I keep saying, it sounds a little corny, but then we can look in that rear view mirror and say, AO, see you later. Enough of you people, we're going to the promised land now. That's where we're headed. EK says that if that were Democrats interrupting a Republican rally, there would have been a lot of more objects thrown in blood spilled possibly. EK, by the way, who's a great member of the community, sent us this awesome care package of uh, homemade knitted blankets and little bears and an alligator for the, for the boys. And they're, they're loving it. Uh, Luke particularly, we're wrapping him in that blanket. He's just loving it. Soft, whatever you use, super soft. Thank you for that, EK. Uh, guys, if you have not liked and subscribed on YouTube and Rumble, please go ahead and do that. Uh, as I just mentioned, we just closed out October. We crushed it on YouTube by like 50% bigger or maybe it was even 60% bigger than any other previous month in the history of the channel. Rumble is absolutely blowing up. I think the message is getting across. I think new people are finding us. I think the algorithms are being a little bit nicer to us. Um, I think some people found us through the Bill Maher thing. Um, it's all amorphous, but if you always want to stay directly in contact with me, uh, rubenreport.locals is the best way. And that's where you're going to get the, the personal side of all of this madness. I leave you, oh, part one of my interview with Senator Tom Cotton is up right now on YouTube and Rumble, the full thing's up on Locals already. Uh, and we leave you with the elderly man pretending to be president uh, at his little Halloween party yesterday. See you tomorrow.